Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome. Um, welcome to the Thomas Paine Study Centre. My name is Paul Dobson. I'm Pro Vice Chancellor for Social Sciences. I had to read that just to make sure I got it right. Um, anyway, I want to introduce Joni. She joined UEA as a Professor of Psychology in October 2021. She is an international authority in child development with a special focus on learning difficulties and developmental conditions. Her research uses the core principles of developmental and cognitive psychology to provide mechanistic accounts of children's development, evaluate interventions, and translate research findings into practice. Joni completed her first degree in applied psychology at the University of Durham in 2001, achieving a first class honors degree. She stayed on at Durham to complete her PhD in psychology, which was awarded in 2005. Joni secured a lectureship at Leeds Met upon completion of her PhD, which she left after a year to pursue a postdoctoral position at the University of York. She worked at the University of York for three years before moving to the University of Northumbria as a senior lecturer. Two years later, in 2011, she moved to the MRC Cognition and Brain Sciences Unit at the University of Cambridge to take up a position as Senior Investigator Scientist. During her time in Cambridge, she became the head of the Centre for Attention, Learning and Memory, a research centre specialising in understanding how children's cognitive skills impact learning from childhood through to adolescence. Joni worked in Cambridge for 10 years before joining us here at the University of East Anglia. Today, Joni will be speaking about her early career work that explored the role of memory in school learning and about her more recent work that has been exploring the ways in which we identify and support children with additional needs. Please join me in welcoming Professor Joni Holmes to give her inaugural lecture. Thank you very much for that fantastic uh, introduction, Paul. And thank you to everyone who's joined us here today, whether you're in the room or listening online. So as Paul said to you, I'm going to be talking to you today about my research programme, which has really started with trying to understand the cognitive processes that might constrain learning, and has now moved into challenging the ways in which we identify and support children with additional needs. It really is a true honour and privilege to be standing here today as a professor of psychology. If you'd asked me when I was 16 what I would be doing in my 40s, there is absolutely no way I would have thought that I would be stood here today as a professor. And this is in no small part because I had absolutely no idea that you could actually be a professor for a job. In fact, I didn't really even know what being an academic or getting a PhD would mean. At 16, I was far more obsessed with Kurt Cobain and Nirvana, as you can see by the posters on my bedroom wall. And I'd just finished work experience in a law firm, which I had absolutely hated. So I had my heart set instead on studying animal behavior. And it was my love for animals that started when I was really, really young. So I decided while I was at sixth form to apply to Nottingham to do a BSc in animal behavior. Now, I guess you could say it worked out quite well that I didn't actually get a place on that course. I ended up doing psychology at Durham instead. And I have really loved studying human behavior and psychology, and I'm going to tell you about this work today. But I haven't actually lost that interest in animal behavior, and I now get to study it far less formally at home with my dog, Coco. She's incredibly loving, great fun, very stubborn, and as many of you in here will know, she's also very noisy. So that's a little bit about my life and how I came to be studying psychology. And now I want to move on to tell you about the science that I've been involved in. So the broad question that has framed my research has been, why do some children struggle to learn? What I want to do is first of all introduce you to three children who face additional challenges at school. So we're going to meet Freddie, Billy and Eva. I always get told off and I just find it really, really hard to concentrate and do everything properly and I just, yeah. English is like 
harder because in writing and um, reading, um, my reading's like not gone really well, and then my uh, my writing has improved like a lot since I was in primary school. Even with um Okay, so here you've heard the three children talking about the additional challenges that they face. So Freddie has difficulty paying attention. He's fidgety and he's always on the go. In his own words, he says that he can be disruptive in the classroom. He has difficulties in reading and maths, and he has a diagnosis of ADHD. You met Billy, who also has difficulty paying attention. He's receiving extra support in multiple subjects at school. He can be easily distracted, and he experiences anxiety. And in fact, Billy has a therapy dog who works with him called Buster. Yet despite facing these additional challenges, Billy does not have a diagnosis of a neurodevelopmental condition. And then you also met Eva. So Eva has difficulties in reading. In the past, she's received uh, speech and language support. She also experiences anxiety, finds it difficult to pay attention, and she has a diagnosis of dyslexia. So you can see that these three children have a range of additional challenges. You can see they have some common characteristics such as finding it hard to pay attention, having difficulties in reading and struggling at school. But they also have some distinct characteristics as well. So for example, Freddie is described as always being on the go, and Eva has particular difficulties related to language. So how is it that we start to understand how these difficulties have come about? Well, in my work, I've used two broad approaches. I've used one approach where we've tried to understand the mechanisms, so that is the processes that might constrain children's learning in the classroom. And we've also used more data-driven approaches. And this is where we collect data at on a large scale, and we use this data to really inform us about what might predict particular outcomes for children. So I'm gonna tell you about both approaches today. I'm going to start by first of all thinking about the mechanisms that might constrain learning. When I'm talking about mechanisms, what I'm really talking about are the different factors that might influence child development and influence a child's capacity to learn in the classroom. So here I'm talking about everything from genes through to the environment in which a child grows up, to uh, thinking about brain structure and brain function, as well as the cognitive processes. So things like how children listen, attend and remember information. So I'm really interested in the cognitive processes. So a child's ability to listen, attend, and remember information when they're in the classroom. And much of my early work focused on one specific cognitive mechanism that we call working memory. For those of you who are not sure what working memory is, it's a term that we use to describe our short-term memory. It's the aspect of short-term memory that we actually use to just hold on to information in the here and now, but also to be able to use that information in the course of a particular activity that we might be engaged in. So let me give you an example of when you might use your working memory. If I ask you to multiply together 27 by 3, you immediately have to try and hold on to the problem information. You engage your working memory. And then you have to use the problem information and process it to work out the answer. So you're actually simultaneously processing and storing information in the here and now. And that's your working memory that enables you to do that. So what we know is that working memory has a limited capacity. And this should make sense to you. Of course, there's a finite amount of information that you can hold in mind at any given time. We can measure working memory quite simply in children. And what we know is that a child's working memory capacity or the amount of information that they can hold on to at any given time, is a strong predictor of how well they will do at school. Conversely, we know that children who perform more poorly than children of the same age on working memory tests are likely to be falling behind at school. On these graphs here, I'm presenting to you the performance of children on their Key Stage 2 national assessments. 
And the children are grouped according to whether they were achieving below what we would expect at the nationally expected level or above average. And what we're plotting here are the working memory scores. And hopefully you can see on the screen that the individuals who had below average performance on the English national curriculum assessments had lower working memory than those who were doing better. And the same was true for maths. So we can see that working memory capacity is associated with school performance. And we also know that variability in working memory performance is associated with a range of neurodevelopmental conditions. So my early work and that of others around the world show that there were these strong associations between working memory performance and children's learning. And we became really interested in understanding just how is it that working memory might constrain class from learning. In order to answer this question, we had to think long and hard about the kinds of activities that children engage in in the classroom that would draw on working memory. One of them that we became really interested in was the idea that working memory might constrain a child's ability to listen to instruction sequences. So if you think about being in a classroom environment for a moment, a teacher is often giving out instructions about what the child has to do, both in terms of where they should be in a classroom, but also instructions that are specific to particular learning activities. And these instru instruction sequences are often quite long and complex and have multi-steps involved in them. So they're going to demand a lot of working memory. You've got to hold on to this information and carry out the instruction sequence. So we wanted to test experimentally whether or not working memory really did support a child's ability to follow instructions. In order to do this, we devised a lab-based experiment where we got children to follow sequences of instructions that we made progressively longer. So here's an example. A child would be sitting down and in front of them would be an array of props. Things such as rulers, pencils, folders, boxes. And we would ask children to carry out a set of instructions such as pick up the yellow ruler, put it in the blue folder, and then put the blue folder in the red box. So there's three things that the child has to remember to do. And we could actually extend this and add more instructions on. So we could really get to a child's working memory capacity. And we would then ask them while they were carrying out this task, to also carry out another task at the same time. So they were, for example, we would ask them to repeat the word the, so they would have to say the, 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 while they were trying to carry out the following instructions task. Or they would have to count backwards in threes. Or we would get them to tap out a sequence on their body. And we looked at how much each of these secondary tasks interfered with performance on the primary task of trying to follow the instructions. And what we found was that the tasks that were tapping into working memory, so repeating the, 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 or counting backwards in threes, disrupted children's ability to follow the instructions in a very significant way. So this really shows us that verbal working memory, the verbal, your ability to hold on to verbal information in the here and now, is really important for following sequences of instructions. So why might this be important in the context of learning? Well, we know, as I said a moment ago, that teachers are often giving out instructions about what children have to do in order to complete a particular learning activity. If you're a child who struggles to hold on to more than one or two things at a time, then you're going to find it very difficult to remember the goal of the activity and the steps that you need to follow to complete that activity. And what will happen then is that you will typically either abandon the task or you'll fail to complete it. We know that learning relies on children completing learning activities in a classroom over time. The assumption being that within each activity they will learn something new. They build on that in the next lesson and the next lesson and so on. So they accumulate knowledge over time via successfully completing these learning activities. If you're a child who's got a poor working memory and you're failing to remember what you've got to do for each of those activities, you're frequently going to miss out on those learning opportunities. And over time, this is likely going to impact on your progress at school. So this is just one example of us investigating how working memory might actually impact on a child's progress at school. We've shown that it was associated with learning and that it would constrain children's abilities to follow instructions. So the next question was, okay, if working memory is so important for learning, 
Is there anything that we can do about a child's working memory? Can we train their working memory? Can we make them better able to remember information? So in the early 2000s, there was a huge explosion of interest in this idea that you could use computerized brain training programs to improve a child's, uh, to improve cognitive function. And this wasn't just restricted to us doing scientific studies. I'm sure many of you came across some computerized game, maybe on the Nintendo Wii, that claimed to improve your intelligence, improve your attention, improve your memory. Some of them even made really bold claims about improving your golf swing. So I'm sure that you, you've, you've come across these games. Uh, the claims were bold. They made a you know, huge splash across the media. Claims that if you completed these training games, you could complete 20 sessions and boost your IQ by 15 points. So we became really interested in these kinds of programs. And we became interested in trying to under understand whether or not working memory training programs could actually improve working memory. So what did these programs look like? Well, here's an example of two of the kinds of tasks that a child might complete in one of these working memory training programs. In the top one, the child would hear a series of numbers, such as three, five, eight, and then they would be asked to recall those numbers in backward order and click them into the keypad. So they would have to click, for example, eight, five, three. In the bottom one, here you had a series of lamps displayed on screen that would light up one at a time. The child had to remember the order in which the lights lit up, and then they had to click them into the keypad in the same order in which they lit up. So here you've got an example of a more verbal memory task and a more visuospatial or non-verbal task. Now the key thing about these training activities is that they would start at a particular level, for example, having two digits to remember, and as the child became confident, uh, competent, they would in increase in difficulty. So a child would then have three items to remember, four items, five items, and so on. If the child started to fail at a particular level, they would calibrate back down again. So in this way, they were always challenging a child to work at their own working memory capacity. And the idea was that over time, they, this capacity should grow and they should be able to remember more information. So while these kind of programs are out there in, in the public, you know, the Nintendo Wii games were out there, there were claims in the scientific literature that training programs such as this one could improve a child's working memory, that they could also improve a child's ability to learn in the classroom, and moreover, they could improve a child's attentional skills, therefore reducing some of the characteristics of ADHD. But many of these studies were quite weak in terms of the designs and the rigour of the test in which they put the programmes through. So we actually ran the first double-blind randomised control trial to try and test whether or not working memory training was effective in both boasting children's working memory and improving their learning outcomes. So in this particular trial, we asked children to either train on that adaptive version of the working memory training programme, where the tasks were always getting more difficult and adapting to the child's memory capacity, or they trained on a placebo low-dose version. So in the placebo version, children only had to remember two items of information throughout the entire training protocol. The children didn't know there were two training programs. They didn't know which one they were allocated to. The people who were actually carrying out assessments with the children before and after the training, they also didn't know which condition the children had been allocated to. So in this way, it was a double-blind trial. We measured children's performance on a set of working memory tasks before and after training. And what you can see on this graph here is the change across a series of working memory tasks from before to after training. So here you can see the gains that were made for those who were in the non-adaptive placebo version. Here you can see, hopefully, quite easily, that the gains for those in the adaptive training condition were significantly greater than those for the children who completed the non-adaptive version of the training program. And the gains that we saw for those in the adaptive program, they were, they were still there six months later. So using this double-blind randomized control approach, we'd shown that if you train on working memory tasks that are adaptive, you will see improvements on untrained working memory tasks. However, we found no evidence at all across this study and many others that these kinds of training programs could improve children's learning. 
So there was no difference in terms of learning outcomes between the children who completed adaptive or non-adaptive training. We also carried out a number of field trials with working memory training. So as well as trying to test really rigorously whether or not we could boost working memory and learning, we also wanted to test whether or not you could use these kinds of training programs in a school context. What we found was that it was quite easy to implement working memory training in primary schools. So a typical protocol would involve completing 20 sessions of training. We found that about 85% of children were able to complete the full 20 training sessions. However, in secondary schools, we found that fewer than 5% of children were able to complete the training protocol. And this is probably because the children are moving around a lot more in a secondary school environment. It's much harder to find that dedicated time to complete these kinds of training programs. In, the study, in these studies, we also measured children's attainment from the beginning of the school year to the end of the school year. And we compared the change in attainment between those who'd completed the training versus those who continued with schooling as usual. And we showed that there was no additional benefit to completing the working memory training. So again, showing that there was no evidence that working memory training could boost children's learning outcomes. So working memory training did seem to improve memory abilities, but we didn't see any generalised effects beyond the training tasks or tasks that were similar to the training tasks. So we then decided to set about doing some experimental work, and this was with adults, trying to explore why we didn't get any generalised benefits of training. So one big question that we had was, if you train on working memory tasks, are you bringing about a fundamental change in somebody's underlying working memory capacity? If you are, then if you train them on one type of working memory task, you would expect to see benefits on any other type of working memory task. So to make that a little bit more concrete, here are two different working memory tasks. So one of them is a backward recall task, this is like the task I explained to you earlier, where we would present children with a series of digits and they would have to remember them and then recall them in backward order. A different type of task is something like an end back task. So here you have digits appearing on screen one at a time and you're asking someone to press a space bar every time the number on screen matches one that they saw a certain number of positions back in the sequence. So in the example I've shown here, we are asking people to press the space bar when the current number that you see on screen matches one that they saw two positions back in the sequence. Okay, so these are two different types of working memory task. What we would predict is that if you got somebody to train on a backward recall task, if you were bringing about generalised working memory impairments, you should see gains on that end back task. So this is what we tested in adults. And what we actually found is that if you train on a backward digit recall task, you get really good at that task. It doesn't improve your performance on the end back task. So this really shows us that working memory training is not boosting an underlying working memory capacity. It's just training you to be really good at the task that you're training on. So the next question that we asked was, OK, if we now just look in more detail at that backward recall task, if we get people to train on backward recall with numbers, do they get better at backward recall with letters or with spatial locations? And here what we found is that if you ask people to train on a task where they're remembering these numbers in backward order, they do get a bit better at remembering letters in backward order and a little bit better at remembering spatial locations in backward order. But the effects get smaller and smaller the further away you move from that training task. So this really shows to us through a series of experimental studies that the working memory training effects that we're getting are really quite task specific. In other words, if you want to have a great party trick of recalling 17 numbers in backward order, you can train on these kinds of tasks. But if you want to try and improve a child's working memory capacity with a view to improving how they might learn in the classroom, then you're not going to get those kind of effects. So continuing to sort of think a bit about working memory training, we then started to wonder whether or not you could actually enhance the effects of working memory training. So this was work that we carried out with adults. And we became interested in the idea that you might be able to use transcranial electrical brain stimulation to improve training performance. 
So transcranial electrical brain stimulation, or TES, as we call it for short, involves applying electrodes to the scalp. So you basically put pads on someone's head. And you apply the, scalp, the pads above an area of the brain that you think might be implicated in the task that you're trying to make people better on. So if we're thinking about working memory training, we might put the electrodes over the frontal parietal regions of the brain. And then what you do is you apply a very low voltage current. And this low voltage current is the idea or the theory behind this is that it should excite the neurons under the scalp and get them into a state where they're more ready to fire. So that when you engage in a learning activity, those neurons are quite excited, more ready to fire, learning should happen more quickly. And you may even get some transfer of training gains. So we became really interested in thinking about brain stimulation and whether or not we could use it to enhance, enhance both the rate at which people would gain on the training tasks and also to test whether or not we could see any more generalised enhancements following training if people had this kind of stimulation. So we compared brain stimulation like this, where we had the active stimulation, with a sham or fake version. So in the fake version, people had the electrodes on, they thought that they were getting the stimulation, but they weren't. So I'm just going to show you this graph, which shows you the gains on different working memory tasks for people who completed training with brain stimulation in dark blue, and people who completed the training with the fake stimulation in light blue. Now hopefully you can see there's barely any difference between those two colours, which shows you that the brain stimulation did not enhance the effects of training. Okay, so we're about halfway through everything that I'd like to say today. I hope that you're enjoying it and following me so far. Just to pull together what I've shown you so far. I've shown you that working memory performance can be used to predict children's learning outcomes. I've shown that you can train people's working memory, but it will only make you better on the tasks on which you've been training. And I've shown to you that if you train on working memory tasks, the gains don't generalise to learning, and you can't enhance them with brain stimulation. So why doesn't working memory training work? Well, it might just be that using these kinds of gamified training programs doesn't really do enough to help improve working memory. Or it might be that you can't change a child's working memory, and that actually you need to think about alternative kinds of support for children who might struggle to hold on to information in the classroom. And here you might think about developing classroom-based interventions where you might help teachers to deliver information in a way that breaks it down so that you don't overload a child's poor or limited working memory. It's also very likely that it's more than just working memory that determines learning outcomes. I mean, that makes sense. And in fact, what we probably think and we probably know is that it's actually a constellation of relative strengths and weaknesses across multiple aspects of cognition, but also multiple aspects of behaviour, the environment and genetics that will determine child development and that will determine a child's capacity to learn in the classroom. And we now have great and fantastic methodological advances that allow us to try and embrace some of this complexity when we're trying to understand why children might be struggling at school. So this leads me very nicely into the more recent work that I've been involved in, where we've been doing just this. We've really been trying to think about what does it mean to be a struggling learner and how do we embrace the complexity of what it's likely to be, to be like if you are neurodivergent and you're struggling at school. So to begin this second half, I just want to take you back to Freddie, Billy and Eva. So Freddie, Billy and Eva have different, have, there's a different diagnostic status for the three children. You can see that Freddie has a diagnosis of ADHD, Billy doesn't have a diagnosis, and Eva has a diagnosis of dyslexia. Now why is this important? Well, it's important because we typically use a child's diagnostic status to inform the kind of support we might be providing for them. So if you're a child like Freddie who has ADHD, you're likely to be taking some kind of stimulant medication such as methylphenidate, which you might have heard of as Ritalin. If you're Billy who faces additional challenges in the classroom, but you don't have a diagnosis, you're likely to be receiving some additional one-to-one -one support perhaps in the form of a teaching assistant. 
If you're Eva and you have a diagnosis of dyslexia, you might have received some speech and language therapy support, but you're also likely to be engaged in some kind of phonics support at school. So this diagnostic framework is what we currently use as a heuristic, if you like, as a quick way to tell us what kinds of support we might need to provide for children. And this diagnostic framework has framed much of the research that we've been carrying out into trying to understand why children face these additional challenges. So let me tell you a little bit about the classic way in which we would go about understanding neurodevelopmental differences. So what we might do is think, OK, I really want to understand ADHD. I'll select a group of children who have ADHD, and I will compare them to another group of children. This might be a group of children who don't have a diagnosis, or it might be a group of children who have a different diagnosis. And then we would compare the two groups on a set of measures. So this might be, for example, working memory. Or we might be looking at activation in particular regions of the brain and how this differs between the groups. Then based on where we find these group differences, we would then come up with a, a theory that explains neurodevelopmental differences. For example, variability in working memory characterises ADHD. And then we would come up with an intervention that's designed to target working memory with the hope that it might improve, for example, some of the characteristics of ADHD that a child might find challenging. So this is the classic approach that we would use adopting a diagnosis-based uh, framework for understanding neurodevelopmental differences. I want to stop for a moment and just think about some of the challenges of this approach. So when we're studying neurodevelopmental differences in this way, everything that we know is driven by the sampling that we use. So if we use this diagnosis-led or category-based approaches where we're comparing groups of children who have different diagnoses, or we're comparing children who perform above or below a particular cutoff on an assessment, then we're really kind of biasing what we're going to find. This is for many different reasons, but the first one we should know is that having a diagnosis is actually not even across all children. In fact, there are racial and socioeconomic disparities in the likelihood of receiving a diagnosis. If you are a white child living in a higher socioeconomic area, you are more likely to receive a diagnosis. And what this means for research and trying to understand why children might be struggling, it means that our samples are not representative and they're not diverse. A related issue is that if we're always relying on these diagnostic-based approaches or these cut-off-based approaches, then we're going to be excluding children who have milder needs that might be nonetheless as significant and impactful on a child's life. They won't be represented in our studies because they don't meet a diagnostic threshold or a cutoff for inclusion. We're also going to be excluding children who face additional challenges who don't have diagnoses. So children like Billy, who I've introduced you to. And we also are going to be excluding children who have more complex and co-occurring needs. Because in many of these studies, when we're selecting children with a particular diagnosis, we exclude children who have more than one diagnosis. We just look really at a very rarefied group of children. Using this kind of approach also carries a number of assumptions that don't really reflect the reality of what it is like to be a neurodivergent child. So if we're comparing two groups of children with different diagnoses, the assumption is that they have different characteristics that arise through different causes. Now, if you think back to Freddie, Billy and Eva, their diagnostic status was different, but they did have many characteristics in common. So the characteristics are not distinct based on diagnostic status. And we also know that these kind of approaches rely on the assumption that children with the same diagnosis to one another will have a common set of characteristics that arise through a common cause. If you've ever encountered a group of children with ADHD, you will know they can be very, very different to one another. So the idea that they present with the same characteristics, again, doesn't really reflect reality. So if we've got these challenges, what can we do that's different? Well, in our work, we've been adopting an alternative approach that we call a transdiagnostic approach. So here we move away from studying groups of children based on diagnostic status and we instead focus on the mechanisms and processes that might capture neurodiversity. 
And what I want to do is to tell you about one very large study that I've been leading over the last maybe eight years now, where we've been adopting a transdiagnostic approach to trying to understand why some children struggle at school. So the study has a really nice acronym of CALM. It stands for the Centre for Attention, Learning and Memory. If you ever came to the CALM clinic in Cambridge, you would realise it is anything but CALM. It's a fun place to be, but it certainly wasn't CALM. But it's a nice acronym. It works well. So what did we do in this study? Well, when we started it in about 2013, 2014, we thought long and hard about who we wanted to include. If we want to understand more about what it's like to struggle at school, who should we get involved in the study? And what we wanted was a really large sample of children that represented the broad heterogeneous population of struggling learners. We wanted a really varied sample. So to get this sample, we worked very closely with a large group of health and education practitioners. And we asked them to refer to us any child aged 5 to 18 who had additional difficulties in attention, learning or memory. The key thing was that we didn't care about the child's diagnostic status. We didn't care if they had one diagnosis, five diagnoses or no diagnoses. If a practitioner had recognised the child as having some additional needs, then we would like them in the study. So when we started this particular study, I think we were thinking, oh, we'll be lucky to get maybe 100 children through the doors. We were actually able to recruit 800 children. And we completed a broad, range, a broad range of assessments with these children. So we wanted to measure many likely candidates that would predict learning outcomes. So we didn't restrict ourselves to any particular theory. We actually drew on lots of existing theories to determine the kinds of assessments that we might run. And we actually ended up collecting data on everything from genetics through to brain structure and function, cognition, behaviour, learning and mental health. And we have been able to analyse these data. So we have the data on 800 children who came to the clinic. We have data from 200 children who formed a comparison sample. And we've now followed these children up five years later. And we've used quite complex techniques that have allowed us to try and capture some of the complexity in the data, to try and understand what it's like to be a struggling learner. I don't have time to tell you about all of the studies that we've published today. We have published quite a lot using these data. But I'm going to focus on three specific questions. The first, are there different cognitive routes to being a struggling learner? Do diagnoses correspond to behavioural profiles? And does mental health predict learning in struggling learners? So let's take the first question. Are there different cognitive routes to being a struggling learner? So in this study, we used a machine learning approach to try and identify subgroups of children who had similar cognitive profiles to one another. I'm not going to go into the ins and outs of how we carried out these analyses, partly because it's a lot for me to remember it, but also I want to be able to give you the, the kind of main message from this particular study. So what we essentially tried to do was to map in space groups of children who had similar profiles on a range of cognitive tasks. So here's an example of the map. Each of these small squares, if you like, would correspond to having a different cognitive profile. The squares that are more close together on the map have more similar cognitive profiles. And essentially what you do in a very simpli uh, simplified way of explaining this is you allocate children to each of these squares based on their cognitive profile. So what you end up with is a map on which children who have similar cognitive profiles are represented close together on the map. Children who've got different cognitive profiles to one another will be further apart. And then you can ask questions such as, show me all the children who've got a particular diagnosis. And if they have similar underlying cognitive profiles, then they should be sitting together on the map like this. So you might find that all the children with ADHD will group together because they have similar cognitive profiles, that all the children with dyslexia might group together. Do you think that that's what we found? Great. <laughs> You're following me. This is good. OK, so we found that the children's diagnostic status did not map onto their cognitive profiles. In other words, if you were to show all the children with ADHD on that map, they would just be dispersed across the map. They had quite different cognitive profiles to each other. 
So what did we find? Well, we could then use something called cluster analysis to identify subgroups of children who had similar cognitive profiles. So we're carving them up, up now to look at children who had similar profiles to one another. We identified four different cognitive profiles. There were children who, whose performance was relatively poor across all of the cognitive tasks. There were children who were characterized by having relatively poorer performance on the working memory tasks. There was a group of children who had age-typical performance on the tasks, and a group of children who were characterized by having phonological difficulties. So difficulties kind of processing and remembering the sounds of words. And then we wanted to know, well, what do the learning profiles of these four groups of children look like? So we plotted out their performance on measures of spelling, reading, and maths. The further down the bar is, the poorer the child's performance is. So hopefully you can see by looking at these graphs that the children who had broad cognitive difficulties, they had quite broad learning difficulties. The children who had age-typical cognitive performance, they had age-typical learning performance. Now when you look at these two groups here, the children who had working memory difficulties, those who had phonological difficulties, what you can see, hopefully, is that their learning profiles were remarkably similar. Now, if we were predicting ahead of time, based on our theories, what, might, what, what these learning profiles might look like, we might have predicted that children with phonological difficulties would struggle more on the reading and spelling tasks, and that the children who had working memory difficulties might struggle more on the maths tasks. But actually, using this data-driven approach, we've shown that that's not the case. We've shown that you might find two children in the classroom who present with very similar learning profiles, but who have very different underlying cognitive profiles. In other words, there could be two different routes to having the same kind of learning profile in the classroom. So now let's move on to the second question. Do diagnoses correspond to behavioral profiles? Well, here we used a very similar technique to the one that I explained previously. Slightly different, we were using network analysis and then identifying clusters of children with similar profiles, but here we were focusing on the children's behavioural profiles. So we were actually looking at grouping children together based on how they were rated in terms of their behaviour. And we were using data in this example from the Connors questionnaire, which is commonly used in the diagnosis of ADHD. So this is the map that was produced. The colours just correspond to the different groups that we identified. So we identified a group of children shown in yellow, and these were characterised. You probably can't read this graph, so I will just explain it to you. These children were characterised by having the greatest difficulties paying attention. They were hyperactive and impulsive, and they were also relatively... Um, they were struggling somewhat with uh, executive function, so with things like working memory. We had a second group here in blue. So these children were rated as being quite aggressive and as having difficulties making and sustaining friendships. And then we had the group in red whose predominant difficulty seemed to be in learning. Now that profile of children in the yellow really maps onto what you might expect for children who have an ADHD diagnosis based on the diagnostic rubric for actually identifying ADHD. So we then asked the same question that we'd asked before. Are all the children with ADHD sitting in that yellow cluster? What do you think we found? No. Yay, well done. <laughs> so they weren't, you're right. What we found is when we, when we displayed the children on this map who had different diagnoses, we found that they appeared in all clusters. In other words, a child's diagnosis doesn't map onto their behavioural characteristics. And this is really quite important because often diagnoses of neurodevelopmental conditions are based on a child's behavioural profile and based on rubrics that we might use to say, yes, they have this, no, they don't have that. And you can see here that actually in this case, these diagnostic rubrics do not map onto the behaviours that the children have. OK, so the final question. Does mental health predict learning in struggling learners? So here we administered a range of assessments of mental health. So we had parents rate children's mental health and we had the children themselves rate their own mental health. And what we found is that their, uh, their mental health characteristics could be broadly categorised into two groups. So these were internalising characteristics, so things such as feeling fearful 
worrying, feeling sad or depressed. Or they were grouped into externalizing characteristics. So things such as being aggressive, finding it hard to make friends and sustain friends, maybe being a bully. And things like being hyperactive and finding it hard to pay attention. So we were interested in looking at how these two big sets of characteristics might predict learning. And what we found is that there was a strong link between internalizing characteristics and learning. When it came to the externalizing characteristics, we found that it wasn't social difficulties that predicted learning, but it was instead the characteristics that we might associate with neurodevelopmental differences. So things such as struggling to pay attention and being hyperactive. So what have we learned from the data that we've collected through this large study? Well, hopefully I've been able to show to you that similar learning difficulties can arise from very different underlying cognitive profiles. That behavioral difficulties in struggling learners don't align with diagnostic boundaries. And that when we're thinking about what it's like to be a struggling learner, we do need to consider mental health. We're all aware that mental health is something that we're talking about more freely and schools are much more aware of. Here we've shown, in the case of struggling learners, that it's likely to be especially important, especially these internalizing characteristics. So when we take these data together, what are we really showing? Well, what we're showing is that we need a really a radical rethink about how we define and support children's needs. The work that we've produced suggests that these diagnostic categories don't really represent what it's like to be a struggling learner. They don't really map onto a child's cognitive or behavioral profile. So instead, what we're suggesting is that we need to use a child-centered approach to thinking about how we might support these children in the classroom. I'm going to end there, and I'm just going to finish with some thanks. I'd like to say a huge thank you to everybody who's been part of my research group, both today and in the past. An enormous thank you to my collaborators in CALM, and a huge thank you to the many people who've been involved in collecting the data for that study that I've just been talking about. I also need to thank our funders. And on a, in a talk like today, I couldn't really end without saying a massive thank you to all the people who've supported me, both personally and professionally. Many of you are in the room today, and I know many of you will be listening online as well, so thank you ever so much. And on that note, I want to say a huge thank you to my mum and dad, who are here today, who have really been my biggest cheerleaders. <laughs> and uh, just speaking of family, my final, my final note for today is just to say a huge happy birthday to my nephew, Ben, who is 12 today. And I think he's listening online, so happy birthday, Ben. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joni. Um, wonderful, insightful lecture. At UEA, we challenge conventional thinking. As social scientists, we use theory, evidence, and experimentation in our studies. And here, we've seen that wonderful combination presented through Joni's work. Um, it's wonderful to have family here, friends, and lots of colleagues, and uh, the community as well at large. Uh, these inaugural events are really important. They showcase the brilliant work that goes on at UEA. It is a rites of passage that many of us as professors have been through. Fortunately, my uh, inaugural wasn't videoed, so, <laughs> it, so it doesn't get brought out at every Christmas event. Um, <laughs> but it is really important that we you know, have these events. And I think what we've seen here is the most important thing. This is about childhood development. These are the future of our country and of our world, and we have to do everything possibly we can to support them. So this work, how it translates into supporting uh, young uh, children through to their development to maximize their potential is wonderful, it's insightful, and it is incredibly important and I was so impressed with the list of uh, collaborators. It looked like one of those screen credits to a Hollywood blockbuster that goes on forever. But that's the truth of our work. It is collaborative, it is team-based, and that's what we do well. So 
can I ask you again to show your appreciation for Joni's wonderful inaugural lecture. Thank you. Now, I know you're desperate to have drinks and everything else that's awaiting for you, but we have our uh, speaker here, so come on, let's ask her some really taxing, teasing questions. And who wants to go first? Please raise your hand and uh, we'll bring you the microphone. I should also welcome um, our friends online as well, if they're listening and have got any questions to relate to us. So, who wants to kick off? Come on, psychologist, don't be shy. <laughs> oh, no, we need this recorded, yeah. Thanks, Joni. That was a really wonderful talk. Um, great to see the, the breadth of work here and appreciated kind of the, the two parts on mechanism, right, and then the second part showing the transdiagnostic approach. My question is, you've shown a lot of ways in which we don't know what we're doing. I wonder if you could... <laughs> that probably reflects how I feel. <laughs> yeah. If you could give us some hope and say maybe one or two things that you think we should try to do that's, that's a little bit different. Okay, so I think, yeah, I did end the talk really on that note. I think in terms of trying to think about how we might identify and support children who have additional needs, I think it really is about taking a child-centred approach. So it's about working with individual children and thinking about what is the area of need that is most impactful on their lives. So if we were to use, I don't know, a diagnostic kind of rubric to say, oh, we think this child is autistic and therefore we need to help them with social and communication difficulties because that's what we've always thought, it might actually be that when we talk to that child and to their family that the most impactful thing on their life might be their levels of anxiety. And so I think we should therefore be talking to children and their families to identify where we should be targeting our support. And do you think so? The tools you've developed might also provide insights to the family as well that, you know, we think anxiety is a big issue, but, you know, you could, you could say, but have you thought about working memory? Maybe you haven't even considered that and kind of do a little sharing back and forth. Yeah, and um, this is actually, I didn't, you know, see in the, in the talk of an hour or just under, um, we didn't have time to really go through all of it. We have done quite a lot of work, particularly when we were working around sort of working memory with educating teachers and parents about what working memory is. And often what we would find is that teachers in particular would say to us, oh, I just thought that child had difficulties paying attention. I just thought it was in one ear and out the other. And of course it was, but it was more about struggling to remember than it was about paying attention. And I think when you just do that little bit of reframing, it can really change for example, how a teacher might perceive a child in the classroom. It's not that they're deliberately like, not paying attention, it's that they are struggling to hold on to information. So I think you're right, it is about sharing what we know more widely and helping people to understand what it might be like to be a child who faces additional challenges. Fabulous, thanks. Thanks, Joni. It was a really lovely talk. I um, just have one question. You talked about the mental health struggles of children who have additional learning difficulties and how anxiety seems to be this kind of common current really across, across these children, but internalizing difficulties more broadly. And I'm just wondering about, and I'm sure that you've, I'm sure you know the answer to this, but the direction of, of uh, the direction of this, are these children anxious because they're struggling learners? Or is the anxiety causal in some way in causing them to struggle in that classroom environment and therefore leading to these difficulties in learning? That's a really great question. And I think the simple answer is that it is different for different children. And um, what we know is that some children might develop anxiety because they are struggling at school and might become a place that they don't want to be, that they don't feel comfortable. But we also know that an anxious child might be completely preoccupied with worrisome thoughts, so they then find it hard to engage in learning. And what we know, actually, when you look across kind of very large-scale longitudinal studies, is that you see this kind of interaction, this sort of dynamic interaction between learning and mental health across time, suggesting that actually they can mutually reinforce one another. So I think what comes first is probably different for different children, but we do know that they can interact. 
and they cause this kind of cascading effect. So I think it's about really trying to break that cycle. Can I be greedy and have another question? Yeah. Um, do you think that, so I think that what you've presented in terms of the data is really great in terms of challenging the value of diagnostic labels. Um, but I'm just wondering in a world where kids with ADHD are prescribed stimulant medication, are these diagnostic labels good enough for that in terms of predicting who's going to benefit from those? Or I think that's a really interesting question. And I think it's probably not that simple. I think if, you, if you're trying to say, if I've understood your question correctly, that the label is enough to tell us that this child would benefit from some kind of stimulant medication. Yeah? yeah? So I think, as I've shown, that actually the behaviours children present with don't necessarily capture the kind of, well, they're not captured by these diagnostic rubrics. So in that case, I would say no, because you could be giving medication out to children based on these diagnostic rubrics that don't really reflect what it's like for the children. On the other hand, a lot of people, so when I was doing the working memory training studies, for example, we did do a study where we looked at the effect of training on children with ADHD when they were on and off medication. And what we found was a real reluctance from schools in particular to take children with ADHD off their medication because they felt that it actually made their behaviour easier to manage in the classroom. So I think, I don't think the rubrics are enough to tell us that this child should have this medication, but I think if you ask teachers, maybe even parents, they would say it does help the child to calm down and pay attention. But I think um, if you look at, say, these medications and we actually carried out a study where we assessed the impact of ADHD medication on children's learning, and we found that it didn't do anything to enhance their learning. So it depends what you're really asking for from the medication, but I certainly don't think a, a diagnostic rubric is enough to, to make those decisions. Okay, uh, do we have any more questions? Um, hi, uh, I enjoyed your talk. Um, so you talk a lot about um, learning outcomes and um, attainment and obviously, um, you know, the quality of learning can be measured in, you know, if a child gets an A or an F or and, um, you know, uh, grades do tend to be valued to some extent, but obviously you've also mentioned things like friendship and mental health, and so I was just wondering, like, how much of this is, like, gone towards measuring attainment and how much is, like, measuring the child's general happiness and learning other things like life skills? That is a fantastic question. So... In the work that I've presented today, we've really been focusing on children's learning and how they perform on school-based assessments and the assessments that we might give them in a research study. But you're absolutely right. Being, you know, development is about more than how you perform on a learning task. It is about well-being. It is about happiness. There's many other factors. And I think it's not been a focus of my work, but it has been a focus of many other people's work. And it's not to say that in my focus on learning that I don't value all the other kinds of outcomes. And in fact, in kind of the more recent work that I'm just starting, we are really focusing much more on mental health and well-being as positive indicators of, of good development, if you like. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any final question from anybody? Yeah. We've got one online, actually, oh, but wonderful. first of all, just to say um, that Ben is watching, so he said thank you very much. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay, this question is from David Rittenberg, and apologies if I mispronounce anything, I'm a film studies grad. Uh, so, with regard to question one, was it coincidental that the working memory graphs appeared 180 degrees out of phases with phonological difficulties? Does this influence attention, mental health? Can you just repeat that, the beginning part of that? I can. So, with regard to question one, was it coincidental that the working memory graphs appeared 180 degrees out of phases with phonological difficulties. So are you referring to the bar graphs or the clusters? The, 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 map. the map. 
Okay, yes, so let me just explain those. I didn't have the time to in the talk. So here, what you're, what you're actually doing, so these are groups of children who have similar profiles. And what you do is you use um, an algorithm, a clustering algorithm, to say, okay, can you carve the map up into groups of children who have similar profiles? And then can you show me where those groups of children sit on the map? So this really just, where the, the kind of clusters of squares are showing, really just corresponds to where the children were on the map. And it is exactly the case that those with working memory difficulties will sit on one part of the map, but those with phonological difficulties will sit on the other, because we've asked it to carve up children into groups based on having different cognitive profiles. So that was really something that came out of the data. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's answered that. So, uh, thank you very much. I'd like to draw it to a close. Um, it was such a great inaugural lecture. Can we please show our appreciation again to Joni? Thank you very much. Please. <laughs> Wonderful. Come and join us for a drink. And thank you very much.